And while she says it wasn't exactly love at first sight, at least for her, (laughs) one thing did lead to another. And in August of 1964, they were united in marriage by that same sheep-stealing Presbyterian associate pastor who convinced Don, a member of the Congregational Church, and Nancy, a Methodist, to become Presbyterian. (laughs) Well, with a start like that, how could it possibly last? And you know it barely did. Surviving thick and thin, better and worse, sickness and health for just 57 years. A life marked by dancing, reading, travel, and all the ups and downs of everyday life. Or as that old preacher Koheleth would say, a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. Like Don, Nancy, who had been teaching school here in Iowa City, had decided that she too was just going to give it another year and then maybe make a move. But now, nearly married, they decided to put their roots down here. Eventually, Don became the bursar at the University of Iowa, where unfortunately he had to put up with the likes of R.D. Allison and Joe Joint and Larry Bruner. No easy task. And while I'm joking about that, there were indeed some rough spots that came with the job, especially being the recipient of countless poison pen letters from disgruntled students, their parents, faculty, and staff, who somehow couldn't seem to wrap their minds around this strange notion that they actually ought to pay their bills. But he survived and even thrived in his work, helped along, no doubt, by his wife, his colleagues, and copious amounts of coffee, drunk morning, noon, and night, world without end. (laughs) Don had room in his heart for the university and for his friends and colleagues there, along with his love for all things Hawkeye, including homecoming and bull badges. And yet, the room opened in his heart when Andrew and Matthew and Jennifer came into his and Nancy's lives to stay. Together, they did everything they could to support and love these three godsends, who I'm sure never, ever gave their parents one minute of trouble. Don was an eternally patient man, they say, but I'm guessing there had to have been a time or two when his patience may have been tried to the limit. But even then, all it usually took was just a certain kind of look from him, and things got straightened out right away. And they had fun. Boy, did they have fun. Trips to the cabin in Minnesota in the summers, maybe using a certain Bonneville convertible to get there, school and other activities at, uh, after, after school was over, movies to watch together, musicals to enjoy. And of course, for both Don and Nancy, there were life lessons to teach, ultimately with great pride and joy in seeing the three of their children grow to adulthood, taking their places in the world. And still, still, even with all of that, his heart grew and got even roomier when those most precious of all human beings, his five grandchildren, made their way into the world. More than anything else, anything else, there was room in Don's heart for his beloved family. But you know, even with that, the boundaries of his heart didn't stop. He also had rooms and chambers in his heart for so many others, especially there was the room he had in his heart for his love of God and the church, lived out as a faithful member of First Presbyterian Church here for more than 57 years, serving it as an elder and a trustee. And perhaps it was his faith, the notion that we are here to love others, even as we have been loved ourselves, that caused him to reach out in so many different and loving ways seeking to touch and change and nurture the lives of others. We can especially see that through his involvement with the Johnson County Foster Care Review Board and the State Foster Care Review Board. And he also shared his life and his friendship through his involvement with the Iowa City City Masonic Lodge and the UI Greyhawks Writing Group. And you see, the thing is, 
no matter where he was. John just had this way of kind of latching on to people, of having them latch on to him, of letting him know that he recognized them and cared about them, be they the kids he encountered at the gym, a waitress in a restaurant here and there, pharmacy techs, you name it. He took time to get to know them, and they all no doubt got exposed to his bad puns and dad jokes, just as I'm sure all of you in this room have been as well. So I suppose in the end, all that I'm trying to say is that Don had an amazing amount of room in his heart, room for lots of things and lots of people, both great and small. And that is what we have gathered here today to remember and to celebrate the roominess of his heart, the generosity of his spirit, and his embrace of life and all things in it. That is who he was, and that is what his life was all about. That is the life's journey he chose for himself and for his life. You know, it's been said that the life of a Christian is like a journey one long journey towards home, towards our true home, toward the very roomy heart of God. Like our Lord Jesus, who had no place to lay our, His head, we live our lives as sojourners, as travelers, as immigrants, as pilgrims in search of that one place where finally we can be at peace. Our journey is a faith journey, a search not just for a place to call home, but a search for the one who is our home. In the end, our search is a search for God, for the roomy heart of God. And we have the courage to seek because we also have the hope that we shall find. Now, if the grave were to be our final resting place, if the tomb were to be our final and true home, if death like the grave was simply to swallow us up and consume us as if we had never been, then none of this would be true. And we would journey toward home in fear rather than with hope. But the good news, the good news, my friends, is this. The one we seek on our journey through life is also the one who seeks for us. The God for whom we search is the God who searches for us. And finding us, this God runs to embrace us, throws arms around us, and as the most gracious of hosts, gathers us to himself, that where God is, there we shall be also. That's what I think Jesus meant when he said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, and I will go and take you to prepare a place for you and come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is saying there's a roominess in the heart of God, a roominess of grace and mercy, a roominess that reaches out to us, embraces us, and gathers us into our one true and final home, into the very heart of God. And that, my friends, is what makes all the difference. All the difference. Sisters and brothers, this is the good news, the good news we celebrate today. Death is not the victor. The grave is not our final resting place. Our home, our true home is with God, who in Jesus Christ triumphs over death and raises us to life, to eternal life. The classic word of our faith is resurrection, the signs of our hope are an empty cross and an open tomb. So I'm here to say, dear friends, that Don Ross is now home, home in the roominess of God's heart and God's love. His 86-year journey through life is now complete. And isn't it ironic? It was his huge heart, so full of life and love, that in the end gave out on him. But when it did, a loving pair of hands reached down in grace and in mercy to raise him to his rightful and true home, even as a voice said, well done, good and faithful servant. 
enter into the joy of your master. So my friends, the God who was with Don throughout the length and breadth of his life's journey is now the God who has received him into the arms of his love and mercy, that where God is, there Don will be, now and forever. And while, of course, there is certainly sadness and grief for us in the midst of all of this, there need be no anger and there need be no fear, for God has graciously received him home, home into the roominess of God's heart of grace and love. And for that, what else can we say except thanks be to God? Amen. Here to tell you even more about the remarkable life of Don Ross is his grandson, Cooper Kirschling. Let me invite him to come forward at this time. Thank you for being here to honor my grandpa. It uh, means a lot to our family. My grandfather, or as I knew him, Poppers, persevered all the way to the end of his time on our planet to make it to his favorite place once more to be with his family. All throughout that last week of his time here, he spent it talking to everyone, including myself, about how things were going and what our dreams or aspirations were. All of these things he already knew. However, I believe that he was trying to capture that last bit of life to remember how proud he was of all of us. I've spent this last week trying to remember every little detail of wisdom and humor that my grandfather shared with me throughout the time that I knew him. And now I'd like to share some of that with you all. First and foremost, notice the little things in your life. It didn't take a lot to make my grandpa satisfied, and this is because he really, truly appreciated the things that others would do for him and would always return the favor. On the day he died, I was looking through his things and found a picture frame with a nice message about how impacting a child's life made all the difference. I'd seen this picture thousands of times before. However, this time I looked at the back of the frame and noticed that he had kept the tag that said who it was from so he could remember that his daughter, my mom, had gifted to him however long ago. This was his first lesson, the little things make a difference. The next bit of wisdom that my grandfather shared with me was to remember the good times and speak of them often. He'd made this point early on in my life because more often than not, when I'd come over to my grandparents' old house, he'd be working on his memoirs so that he could continue to be around all of us even after he would eventually pass. Sure enough, first thing I did when he was gone was go and read a few of them so it felt like he was still there talking to me. I'll never forget the stories he'd tell about his college life and growing up in Clemens. Even after all these years, he remembered him like it was yesterday and could often even tell you what he'd had to eat and how good it was during the event he was recalling. Every time the meal involved a cut of meat, it was always this thick and that big around. <laughs> he led a very interesting life and made a huge impact for being just some kid from the middle of Iowa. And being able to recall all those good times really showed me that he had deeply appreciated his life. One of his greatest passions was Hawkeye sports. After six decades of purchasing tickets for Hawkeye football through thick and thin, we all found ourselves in Lincoln, Nebraska for the last game of that undefeated season in 2015. Our tickets were in the upper balcony of the south end zone, row 93 to be exact. And I remember the morning of that game, he said that he wasn't sure if he was going to go with us or not because of how cold it was. He did in fact end up braving the Arctic temperatures and I'm still not entirely sure whether it was because he wanted to see an undefeated season or because he just hated Nebraska that much. <laughs> However, I am leaning towards the latter, considering it was 12 degrees and windy that day. <clears throat> Poppers also taught me to help those who needed to be helped. No matter how small the task was, Poppers was always there to help. If I needed a ride to band in fifth grade, Poppers was there. If I wanted to watch a movie and no one else did, you bet he was right there watching it with me. Poppers led a life of being helpful to others around him and never really expected anything in return. He gave back to his community because he knew it was the right thing to do and that he was the right person to do it. He taught me to take interest in what people around you had interest in. He did not care much for professional basketball until a close friend of mine and I started to watch it during elementary school. Shortly after, we had made it a tradition to watch the Golden State Warriors every year they were in the finals. 
Even this year, while we were up at the cabin, he'd stay up late with me to watch the Warriors play. And he'd also keep track of the team even when I didn't because he knew how much it meant to me and my friend. Poppers also taught me that family is everything. He'd make these little traditions that involved family being around and would make you think of those who weren't when you'd continue those traditions without them. While at the cabin, he'd always read the Isaac Asimov quiz from the newspaper to the entire family while we sat on the dock and had our coffees. He'd wait until everybody was up, and up awake and down at the dock to do so because it was important to him that everyone did it together. It was a great way to wake up in the morning and you knew you were at the cabin when Poppers was reading the quiz. Mainly, my grandfather taught me how to be a kind, caring, and respectful person who shows others how much he really cares. He taught me to take time out of my day to make someone else's better. Like all the times we'd take early morning trips to the nearby town to get coffee and the newspaper while we were up at that cabin. He taught me to laugh with friends and family as much as you can. His favorite method to go about doing so was by telling horrible puns, which we call Donisms, one of the which I will share, you, or share with you now. <clears throat> A grasshopper walks into a bar and hops onto a stool. The bartender come out, comes over and says, Now you won't believe me, but we have a drink named after you. The grasshopper quickly replies, No way, you've got a drink called Bob? <laughs> those, those, that was his type of humor. Back to less punny lessons, he showed me how important it is to not be afraid to embrace what others enjoy because you might or you may just find something you like as well. He taught me to take up as many interests and hobbies as you can and strive to succeed at them. And finally, he taught me to take it all in and rem remember how wonderful the world is. My grandfather was an amazing human being who touched many lives during his time here on this planet and I hope that someday I can follow in his footsteps and impact others as powerfully as he did. The lessons that Poppers share with me are timeless, and whether or not you knew him all that well, perhaps there's a bit of him you can take with you today to make our world a kinder, gentler place for us all. Thank you. Don's family has asked me to make sure to remind you that you all are invited to share together in a fellowship meal following the committal service that will be held just outside the church at the First Presbyterian Church Columbarium. At the end of the service, we will be led in procession from this room out through the doors by a bagpiper to the columbarium. Those of you who uh, may not want to go all in with some windows that look out onto the columbarium, and you can observe that service there. Otherwise, if you cannot make it to either one of those places, make sure at the end of this service, make your way into uh, Ryerson Hall, and once the family has returned, we'll join together in food and fellowship there. All of you may have some of your own stories and thoughts about Don that you would like to share with the uh, family and with your friends during the time of that meal. I also understand that some folks parked down in the lower parking level of the church and uh, had a hard time making it up the stairs. And I understand that. It's hard on me as well. There is an elevator that has been newly installed in the church, and it's a little hard to find. It's just around the corner, out to the left as you exit the sanctuary and kind of go around the corner. So you don't have to worry about making your way down the stairs. You can uh, take that elevator as well. Now let's pause in silence as we offer to God our own thoughts and prayers about Don and about his life, and then I will invite you to join with me in prayer. Let us pray. God of us all, your love never ends. When everything else fails us, you still are God. And so we pray to you and for one another in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, grant strength. To all who have sinned, bless with your mercy. 
to all who sorrow, comfort now with your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another, for in all our ways we trust you. And to you with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory both now and forever. Loving God, we know that all that you have given us is yours. As first you gave Don Ross to us, so now we give him back to you, praying that you will receive Don into the arms of your mercy and raise him up with all your people. Receive us also and raise us into a new life. Help us so to love and serve you in this world that we may enter into your joy in the world to come. Finally, O God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day, for the gifts of joy in our days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in our days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends, for our baptism and place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. And above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death, and who then rose for our sake, and who even now lives and prays for us. All this we pray in his name, even as we now hear sung the prayer he taught us to pray. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessings of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Now led by our bagpiper, we will make our way to the columbarium. I invite you to stand as the family exits the sanctuary and then follow in kind, either to the columbarium, to Coover Lounge, or to Ryerson Hall. 